Um, Will was saying that there's quite a few people away um, at a marine science meeting that's not normally on at this time. So um, they might they might pop in um, a bit later, but uh, it sounds like there's some pretty big things that they're managing at the moment. So that's all good. What we will do, um, I don't know why I'm looking around. Um, I'm going to put the karakia up, but it's not somewhere around me. It's on my computer. So <laughs> and we can we can start our session. Oh my gosh. You tell it's been a while since I've been um, doing my job, actually, <laughs> with various illnesses. Okay, so I'll go through slowly if anyone wants to, um, is, is like me, um, learning in this space, and, and we can say it together. Hayati awa, utai tsua, utai waho, itipaki aka o tirakao, o mairi nuku, o mairi raki, o mairi o timana whenua. Mara whenua, sorry. I ruka tāne, i raro tāne, tiraki ihi o tāne, paku paku o tāne, no hoka o ti ariki, ko atu i tāne ki uta. So good morning everyone, uh, good afternoon everyone. It is wonderful to see you. Um, I think all of you know me, I'm I'm Rose um, and I'm very excited to hear from Will this morning. Um, Will, like many others in the core, is a imaginary person who lives on my computer in a rectangle um, because I don't get to see actual people anymore, but I have it on good authority that he is actually a three-dimensional and um, goes and does things with, um, with things in the ocean. Um, so welcome, Will. I might hand over to you um, to introduce yourself and um, the amazing work that you and your team have been doing. Uh, kia ora. Thank you, Rose. Um, uh, yeah, cool, Will, cool, Will Raymond Tokawingawa. Um, I'm in the Marine Science Department. I think you all know me. I don't really need to introduce myself, do I? Um, what I will do is share my screen and introduce our amazing research team. Um, and I've got to do a few things while I do this share sound. Yes, that's good. And uh, I will hide these controls and then start that presentation, hopefully. Cool, can you see my screen all looking good and big screen? Excellent, thank you. So yeah, um, I really want to introduce the research team because we're presenting on behalf of the research team. I'm presenting on behalf of the research team, the amazing folks that we work with. Um, I'm the PI on this project, Alana Alexander from the Department of Anatomy is the AI. Um, Martin Guerra, who's also on the call, is the Assistant Research Fellow, um, who's doing pretty much most of the work in this project, actually. So massive thanks to Marta. Um, and Tamlin Summerford from New Zealand Marine Studies Centre. Um, her and Sally Carson are giving us heaps of help with the outreach component of the project. That's really awesome. Um, it's fantastic to be working with them. And then this is Stella Simpson, who's a master's student working uh, on the project, and Whitney Steidel, who's a master's student working on the project as well. So I'm really just presenting on behalf of these folks who are, who are doing most of the work, actually. Um, and we're also, um, there's involvement and support from a bunch of other organisations as well. So um, Alana and I are both at Otago Uni, obviously, I'm in marine science, uh, Alana's in anatomy. Um, but we're also collaborating with the New Zealand Whale and Dolphin Trust, the Far Out Ocean Research Collective, Whale Watch Kaikoura, and NIWA. So big thanks to those folks for their support and involvement. Um, this is what we're focused on, this amazing, interesting, and en enigmatic species, Parawa, the sperm whale, Phycetum macrocephalus. They are important for all kinds of reasons. They're really culturally important. They're important to Māori. Um, they're the taonga, they're seen as kaitiaki at sea, and they're a real um, symbol of abundance when they strand on land, the bones and the teeth in particular are really important. Um, the mataranga surrounding Parawa is really important. Um, a really nice example is at Kaikoura. Um, they're seen as a tohu, they're seen as a sign uh, for the hapuka coming inshore in the wintertime. Um, and obviously hapuka are a really important source of kainuana. So sperm whales Parawa are really culturally important. They're really ecologically important. They are the largest predator on the planet. They've got huge energy requirements. Um, and so they are really important in structuring the pelagic uh, offshore ecosystems in which they live. They're really also, also really important for transferring nutrients around the place. Um, they feed down deep. They feed often in um, over a thousand meters deep on squid and uh, deep water fish. 
Um, but of course they're marine mammals, so they have to breathe air. So they have to return to the surface to breathe. And when they return to the surface, they release nutrients into the surface waters. You can imagine how that happens. Um, and that provides a kind of fertilizer, which um, stimulates primary productivity in the surface waters. So they're really important ecologically for structuring their ecosystems. And they're really important economically as well. Um, so they used to be the, the focus of a really big um, uh, whaling industry, one of the first species to be targeted. Um, and these days, more benignly, they're the focus of a really thriving whale watching industry. Um, so at Kaikoura, for example, there's a, a whale watching industry that's based around sperm whales um, um, run by Whale Watch Kaikoura. The company's Whale Watch Kaikoura. It's owned and operated by Ngāti Kuri, and it's um, reliant on Mataranga Māori and local people for, the, for its operations. So they're really economically important. And I guess like the great voyages of Polynesia, then Parawa make epic voyages across Te Moana, uh, Nui Akiwa as well. Um, so one thing I didn't say is that males and females live in quite different places. The females are the smart ones. They live in nice, warm, tropical and subtropical waters um, in the southern hemisphere. That means the northern part of their range. Males live, or well, the mature males anyway, and the, and the immature, and slightly immature males um, live in more productive waters. They spend most of their time foraging. And so the movements of the males between those foraging habitats and those breeding habitats um, connect those two places. Those, those migrations connect those places. So they connect Aotearoa with the tropical Pacific. So a little bit of motivation for why we wanted to put this study together. Um, I mentioned whaling before. There was a massive impact of whaling on, on the population of Parawa. Pre-whaling, it's estimated that the global population was a bit over a million, 1.1 million, something like that. Um, there were two massive pulses of commercial whaling, one in the 19th century, um, and then one um, just after the Second World War, when nations were kind of rebuilding their infrastructure um, after the Second World War. And that reduced sperm whale populations to maybe about 300,000 worldwide. And the minimum was in the 1980s, just before the moratorium on commercial whaling, um, after which sperm whales started to recover. We haven't got lots of detail about numbers in New Zealand, but we know there were massive impacts in New Zealand. Um, the whalers were really good at keeping logs and some whaling historians have been back and looked at the, um, how many whales were taken, for example. Um, I think Rhys Richards compiled something that on the Solander ground, which is in the western part of uh, Fogo Strait, in a 30 year period in the 19th century, they took 600 sperm whales out of that area. So, you know, really, really massive impact on, on whale populations. Being top predators, they're not massively abundant naturally, right? They need heaps of energy. And so you're never gonna find million, million to them uh, in, the, in, the, in their populations. Of course, the other thing that the impact of whaling did was it eroded the connections between Parawa and the coastal communities which rely on them. So that's a, a really important uh, thing to consider about the impact of whaling. Um, we think that they're found all around the coast of New Zealand, um, but in terms of Western science, at least, they've only been well studied in one place. They've only been well studied in Kaikoura. Um, and our research group, the Marine Megafauna Research Group, has been working at Kaikoura since 1990. Um, we've got this long term monitoring project. Uh, it's kind of the cornerstone of the project is photo ID. Um, we can recognize uh, each whale by this pattern of nicks and notches on its tail fluke. Um, and this is really special. It, gets to, it, it enables us to see these animals as individuals. They're not just the species that we study, but they're individual whales that we actually get to know and they come back and we see them year after year. And so we get to learn things about their lives. So it's a, it's a really awesome part of the project that I, I really, really love. Sadly, um, at Kaikoura, the population seems to be declining, or at least the, the number of whales that visit Kaikoura seems to be declining. This is some work that, um, that Tamlin Summerford did for her master's project. Um, and she looked at the uh, uh, population abundance since 1990 when we started the study. And you can see there's been a, a pretty steady decline in abundance. Most of it's happened in the last 15 or 20 years or so. We're not really exactly sure why that's happened. Um, but there's a potential impact of climate change. So Marta did some really nice work in her PhD when she looked at the correlation between changing oce oceanographic conditions and, and abundance of sperm whales visiting Kaikoura. And there are these correlations between a warming ocean and, and fewer whales coming back to Kaikoura every year. So that's a real concern. <clears throat> and the other thing about sperm whales in Aotearoa is that we know very little about their connections. When the, those whales that we know well in Kaikoura, when they leave Kaikoura, because they're not there for the whole time, when they leave Kaikoura, we don't know where they go. You know, we don't know where um, the whales are born. We don't know where they go to breed. Sort of vague ideas of where it might be, but we don't know specifically. So we know very little about those connections, actually. So there are some, you know, some really big knowledge gaps that we want to fill. 
So this provides, I guess, the motivation for the big goal of the project, which is to improve the understanding of impacts facing Palawa so that traditionally important connections can thrive and persist in the future. And those connections I'm talking about are connections within Palawa populations in Aotearoa, so how are different populations connected or different areas in which we find Palawa, how are they connected? Connections between Aotearoa and the, and the wider Pacific region, um, and also the connections between Parawa and coastal communities as well. So those are the, you know, those connections that we, we want to see persisting and thriving and, and strengthening hopefully as well. So um, that's the big goal, I suppose, and, and we're gonna try and address that goal with four different research questions. Um, the first one is what was the distribution of Parawa and Aotearoa pre-exploitation? So you can imagine that when Polynesians first arrived in Aotearoa, the Parawa population would have been very different. And one way we can try to understand that natural state is to heed the matauranga that's been built up through centuries of um, connections between coastal communities and sperm whale populations. So we want to try and learn, we want to engage with um, coastal communities, um, involve them in the research and try and learn about that traditional eco ecological knowledge. We're really conscious that we need to do that appropriately. Um, and so we'd like to involve Torhunga in this process, the, the real experts, um, uh, um, to try and help us, you know, decide decide and shape the way in which we do this, and we've got some some part of the, some some budget, you know, set aside to involve Tohunga in the process. So so hopefully that that works. Um, we also want to complement the Matauranga with whaling records. So I mentioned whaling records before. The the whalers are, um, were amazing at keeping records about what they were doing. There's some pretty good records out there already, and we're working with um, a whaling historian from Tasmania who can help us un 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 uncover. Um, some other records which will help us learn about what the natural state of Parawa was like before that big impact from whaling. <clears throat> the second research question is how is the recovery of the Palawa population threatened by climate change? Um, so for that we're going to continue this uh, ongoing monitoring program at Kaikoura that I mentioned earlier. The obvious question is is the population still declining? And then what we want to do is try and explain the variations that we see if it's still declining, explain that decline. So we want to do that by linking the demographic rates, things like population size and survival rates and emigration rates from the study area, linking those demographic rates to climate driven variations in oceanography and their prey. So is climate affecting oceanography? Well, we know that's happening, but how is the changing oceanography affecting the prey of sperm whales? And then how is that affecting the, sp the sperm whales in turn? Question number three is how are the contemporary foraging areas in Aotearoa connected? So I mentioned that, you know, pretty much all of the stuff that we know um, comes from Kaikoura. Kaikoura is a really um, a special place to work. And probably the reason that we know so much from there is it's a relatively easy place to work. This is the um, Kaikoura submarine canyon that comes in very close to the Kaikoura Peninsula. So you can literally go out in a, in a little boat, in a six meter boat. Brendan can paddle out there on his paddleboard if he wanted to. Um, and you can go and see sperm whales, you know, just right here, sort of three or four kilometers off the shore. You can see them from the coast on a good day, you know, so they're in really, really close. And that's why I suppose, you know, all of our uh, research has been focused here to date, but we're really conscious of the need to broaden our focus um, to work in other areas to try and place those declines in context. So we're gonna start working uh, in Northland and Otago as well. This is the study area in Northland. There's this um, awesome system of uh, canyons uh, to the north of the Bay of Islands and some interesting bathymetric features up here, which seem to um, provide some interesting oceanography that, that um, concentrates the prey that Parawa will like. So we know there are sperm whales up here. Um, we're working in collaboration with the Far Out Ocean Research Collective. This is um, a, a great connection through MARTA. Um, and we're gonna essentially replicate the kind of surveys that we do at Kaikoura up in these, uh, these other habitats. The other habitat where we're gonna be working is off the coast of Otago. So it was uh, probably about 10 years ago that um, I asked Kim if I could come along on one of the Munida Trentex, because I looked at the map of, you know, the bathymetry off Otago and saw all these submarine canyons off here. And I thought, man, this looks like a great place to find Parawa. This looks like great sperm whale habitat. So I asked Kim if I could come along on one of the Munida Trentex and put a hydrophone in the water at the end of the transect. And sure enough, there were, um, there were sperm whales there. And this was really exciting. Thought, wow, we've got lucky. Went back the next time and we heard sperm whales again. Went back the next time and we heard sperm whales again. And so that's kind of really what sort of piqued our thinking that we, you know, we, could, we could study them in other places. And so again, we're gonna be replicating the, the methods from Kaikoura uh, down here. 
So it's going to be focused on photo ID. We can use photo ID to um, understand how those areas are connected. We, you know, we know individuals. If those individuals move between these places, we'll be able to find out. But there are other methods we can use as well. So we can use the acoustic dialects of sperm whales. They make some, um, some not particularly exciting sounds. I'm going to play you some later if that works. Um, but then it makes some not particularly exciting sounds that echolocation clicks. But when they put their, those clicks together in little patterns, um, a bit like Morse code, they're called coders. Um, those those coders are unique to different clans of sperm whales. So if we if we if record their if we record their sounds, we can look at coders from other parts of New Zealand and, and the wider Pacific and try to understand how those different foraging areas are connected. And then we can also use genetic analysis. So one of the the wonderful things about sperm whales is that they just slough off skin the whole time. So when you're sitting in the water, they're um, paddling along at the surface in between their dives, uh, and they're sloughing off skin. So if you're in the right place at the right time and you've got a sharp eye and a dip net, you can literally just pick skin bits of skin out of the water, uh, and we can, we're going to use those um, bits of skin for genomic analyses to try and tell us um, how the different populations fit together. And we also want to um, employ an army of, uh, of sperm whale observers with a citizen science project. So we can look in these three places in detail. Uh, we wanna know what's happening in between those three different study areas as well. I'll talk about how we're doing that in a little bit. And then the fourth research question is, do the migrations of Parawa form connections between Aotearoa and other Polynesian islands? So there are um, existing genetic samples from other places. Um, and so we can use the genetic genomic data that we get um, to look at those connections. And then, but what we'd really like to do, and this is maybe a slightly ambitious goal, is to go and gather some data ourselves about um, distribution of, of, of uh, Parawa in, the, in, in Polynesian islands, places like Tonga, for example. And so we've got a, a plan to use Voyaging Waka as a research platform. We know it's possible theoretically, practically, um, that's another question. And so obviously we're going to have to um, have some pretty important discussions with the voyaging Tohunga to find out whether it's actually um, a go or not. But that's a, a really exciting part of the project that probably will happen, you know, in the future and in the, in the later part of the CPSS process, I imagine, if it does happen at all. <clears throat> so those are the four research questions. Um, I think this helps, or um, I think that our project aligns quite nicely with the CPSS vision and mission. Um, I absolutely love this diagram. I love this concept figure of the double hold walker. I think it helps us to shape all of our projects. Um, and it's you know, nice to think about how your project fits in with, with this vision. Um, the, the walker has two holes, of course. It's a, it's a double hold walker. There's a well-being hole and a marine hole. Um, the project is underpinned by this concept of Waiora, which is um, health of the physical environment. And, uh, and how the health of the physical environment affects the health of sperm whale populations, and then in turn, how that affects um, coastal communities. It's, um, it's an innately marine project, of course, all, you know, all of the field work for the research goes, off, uh, in the, goes on in the ocean. We're, research, we're researching the ecology of a marine talma species um, and its reliance on a healthy marine environment. So, you know, it's a, it's a really marine project, but it doesn't get much more marine. There are the three platform themes, connecting, understanding, and restoring. We're in the connecting theme, but I think we've also got really good links to uh, understanding and restoring. Understanding in terms of um, ecological relationships and restoring in terms of gaining the knowledge that we maybe require to arrest the decline of, of Palawa populations. And also maybe restoring or strengthening those connections with coastal communities as well. In terms of the Tumu, the moorings, I think the monitoring one is, is the most relevant and it's, it's really relevant. You know, this project is built around a long-term monitoring project um, and they're really important aspects of climate change in here as well. And in terms of the sails, um, the voyaging sail is obviously really relevant. You know, we'd love to be able to undertake some epic voyages um, and, and look for Parawa along the way. So we always try and keep this in mind. <clears throat> How about some progress so far? So our project started in November 21. Um, 21, that's right, yeah. So we've been going about nine months already. Um, obviously we had to start with consultation and the goal was to um, connect with the communities that have these intimate connections with Palawa already um, for a couple of reasons. One, to check that you know what we're proposing to do is okay. And secondly, um, to ask if there are things that they want to know, you know, co-develop the project together. Are there questions that they want answered? Honestly, it's been a slow process. 
Um, I think I was a bit naive when I came into it. I think I was a bit gung ho about it'll be amazing. We'll, got, we'll have a big hooey at the start. We'll get lots of people down. Everyone will talk, share ideas, you know, amazing. It'll just get going and it'll be fantastic. We quickly realized that, you know, that wasn't realistic. That wasn't the right way to do things. Um, and so we took a step back. Um, we had a, some really good advice from Brendan and Danny Poa. We had a, a really good meeting with them about how to approach the consultation process um, more appropriately. And since then, we've slowed down and I think that we're more on the right track now. It's a much more it's a it's a much more organic process for developing those relationships. So we're really appreciative of that advice that we received. And so far, we've engaged pretty well, I think, with Katihui Rapalunaka Kipoka Taraki. So we started off by having a kōrero with them, um, and it was just really nice and really supportive. Um, they invited us to present to their Komiti Kopapatayo, um, which we did. Again, um, it was great. It was really supportive. They asked some really tough questions. Um, there are some, you know, really impressive, powerful, knowledgeable people there. Um, and so, you know, it, um, it wasn't an easy ride, but um, uh, yeah, I think it really helped us develop the project. It was really, really good. Um, and then since then, Grant Meikle from Pukataraki has come along uh, on um, one of our research trips in Otago. So we've been able to share our experiences with Grant and Grant's feeding back to Pukataraki as well. So um, the engagement with Pukataraki, I think, has been, been really healthy. I, um, I've really enjoyed that process. We, we've always engaged well with Wellwatch Kaikoura um, and they helped us to shape the proposal um, and, um, and we you know, continue to talk to them about ways to do it and they support us in all kinds of ways. So um, that's quite natural, but I think the, the relationship is developing. We're building a better relationship with the Runanga at Kaikoura as well. Marta was in Kaikoura last month and she talked to the uh, Enviro Po Hui. And again, they, they were really supportive, but asked some really good questions and had some really um, some good suggestions about how we should do things maybe a little bit differently. And then slowly we're engaging with Nati Kuri in Northland as well. So um, the consultation process, I think, thanks to the, the folks at CPSS is, is going a little bit better now, but there's still an awful lot to do in terms of co-developing a project. <clears throat> we have gone out and got some data as well. Um, so we have been out and, and started the work in all three of our research locations. We've had two field seasons in Kaikoura and one in Otago and one in Northland. Um, we've been out on the water and we found sperm whales in all of those places. You know, we find them reliably, so that's really reassuring. Um, we ID those individuals. So far, we don't have any matches between the different locations, but that's something that may happen in the future. Who knows? We've been going out and getting skin samples um, that you know, will enable us to do that genomic work. Um, we've been recording behavior for comparison between the different places, and we've been getting acoustic recordings as well. And the acoustic recordings are really neat. They enable us to study the behavior of the, of the sperm whales. They give us hints about where they might be foraging, for example. We can analyze the structure of the clicks, so we can actually estimate the length of the whale from the click structure. Um, so that tells us about the different parts of the population that are using these different habitats. And then we can use those acoustic dialects as well. I'm actually going to play you some sperm whale sounds so you can hear what they sound like. These are these were recorded in Otago last month. So these is what Otago sperm whales sound like. So they're not particularly exciting, but um, they're, they're, they're the echolocation clicks. This is what sperm whales use for finding their way around, for finding their food and for navigating. But if they put those clicks together in little patterns, like I was talking about earlier, little coders, then they sound a little bit funkier. out again it's really cool this was the first time i think that coders have been recorded in otago uh, so that's really exciting so this is a really long coder i think it's got eight or nine clicks in it um they're mostly about four or five i think Marta, is that right and they're kind of you know two clicks then a gap and then three clicks or something like that and by um by um looking at the at the coders that have been found in other parts of, of the pacific we might be able to fit the uh, out out of sperm whales and see, and see um, you know see where they fall out in there um we do our research in the different places from different vessels i mentioned how um you know kaikoura is a relatively easy place to work um this is the um, new zealand whale and dolphin trust vessel grampus that we use for our work up there um, this is polaris 2 where we do the um uh, the work off otago and then this is a photo of beautiful northland this is manawanui which is the um far out ocean research collective vessel there's a sperm whale floating in the foreground here Okay, so that's the field work. Um, oh no, it's going to start clicking again. Don't do that. Here we go. 
Um, we have um, we've also made some progress on this on looking at the climate change side of things. Um, so we're collaborating with Niwa and Tom Rowe at Niwa, who's provided an amazing data set of uh, Niwa's research trawls. Uh, Niwa do these research trawls all around the country. They date back to 1960. We've got 40,000 records of their trawls. And it's going to be um, Stella Simpson's job to look through all those trawl records, find the ones that are relevant to sperm whale prey, things like squid and hapoka, for example, um, and then look at the changing oceanographic conditions and how they affect relative abundance, say, of, of squid, and then how that might affect um, uh, where the sperm whales are distributed. So that's um, ongoing. We've actually got the data in hand to do that. It's just now a question of crunching it. So that's really, really exciting. The citizen science part of the project is going really well as well, I think. Um, you might have heard about iNaturalist. It's this website where folks can log their observations of species. Um, and Marta made a really cool uh, project on iNaturalist called South Pacific Sperm Whales. So this drags in sperm whale sightings that anyone makes in Aotearoa. Um, and so we can start to learn a, bit, learn a bit more about their distribution, hopefully. And we have, uh, we're going to publicise that with this flyer um, that we're going to send out to tour operators and fishing clubs and boaties to try and get people to um, record their observations, you know, get them excited about sperm whales. We've also got a Whale and Dolphin Discovery Day coming up. So um, with Tamlin and Sally's help, uh, we've organised um, a sort of a public information day, which is going to be happening at New Zealand Marine Study Centre at the end of October. Um, and we're inviting Tohoho and experts to come and talk about whales and dolphins and, and sperm whales in particular, and really get the public enthused and excited about this and, and, and talk to them about how they can become involved, essentially, how they can, how they can uh, help out with the cetacean research. And of course, there's still lots to do. I think, I think we've done pretty well. Um, you know, we started in November 21 and we've, we're, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the progress so far. It hasn't been a, um, an easy time um, to get projects going. Um, but, you know, the team have been awesome at getting things going and with support from CPSS as well has been awesome for getting things going. Um, but there is still a heck of a lot to do as, um, you know, more consultation and co-development to happen. There's obviously a lot more field work together and then lots of analysis and outreach stuff as well. But so far we're doing OK and it's just been so fun and so exciting to be involved in. Um, I really want to acknowledge the support that we've had. So um, Anne-Marie and Chris were, were, were really helpful for helping us to shape how the, what, what the project looked like. Since it's got going, um, AJ and Mena and Hinarangi have been amazing for actually help us, helping us get it off the ground. You know, it's been a really tricky time to start work, but they've been awesome at that. And then I mentioned Danny and, and Brendan earlier about helping us with that uh, engagement process as well. So we're really appreciative of the CPSS team. Um, Big shout out to our friend Koa Hina Porta at Wellwatch Kaikoura, who's always supportive of the stuff that we do. And it's really nice to keep working with those folks. And we really value that relationship. The crew of Polaris have been awesome. Um, uh, Bill and Mark and, and, um, and John Campbell, when we go out on Polaris, I think they're about as stoked as finding sperm whales as we are, you know, which is really cool. It's really, it's really nice when the, um, when the skippers get stoked about sperm whales as well. Um, this is Jochen Zoisma, this lovely fellow here. He's the skipper of Manawanui, which is this vessel. This is the work that we, um, uh, this is the vessel that we use for the work up in Northland. You can see it's an awful place to work. It's terrible. Um, it's really nice actually to go to subtropical Northland waters when you're used to working off the coast of Otago. I've been lucky enough to go up for one trip, but it's really Marta who, who's making that happen. And I want to give a, a special thank, shout out to Kim as well, because um, like I said, it was the, you know, my thinking about sperm wells in Otago happened um, because of Kim's generosity with um, the time on the Munida transect. And I think she's, she's done that for so many people that um, I think we need to acknowledge that. And, and, you know, part of our project, part of the, the idea for our project is to keep people, put, keep putting people on the, on the Munida transit trips and, uh, and looking out for sperm whales. So thanks, Kim, for your continued support. And I mentioned um, Tom Bro from Niwa as well, who's, uh, who's provided those data and he's providing lots of expertise when it comes to all kinds of parts of the project. So we really value those collaborations and, and really appreciate the support that we've been getting. So that's me. I hope I haven't gone on for too long um, and um, I'd love to, Love to love to chat and, and and hear what people think and if you have questions and so on. But uh, thanks for listening. I appreciate your time. Kia ora well.
That was so great. Uh, Mina's just put up a whale emoji just for you. Uh, oh, thank you. Make sure you notice that. Very important. <laughs> uh, uh, a welcome um, to Sean and to Sherry, who's joined us um, uh, as as Will was talking. Um, gosh, that was that was just fantastic, and um, it's wonderful to see uh, things up and running, and um, also to hear, uh, I guess. Um, the important role that the, the CPSS infrastructure plays and, and can support in that space because the core is, is much more than just a funding body. It's a, it's a network and an infrastructure and a, a community, I guess, for, for creating projects that are um, just, just next leveling from um, what we might have been able to do uh, as, as smaller teams. Um, and uh, there's so many riches in this uh, as it's, it's just beginning, but you can just see so many wonderful places and spaces where this can go. And, and your team is really diverse as well, Will, which is, um, is really, really exciting. Uh, what I, I'll do is, is just open us up for questions. Uh, if anyone, or, or comments as well. Um, I think, you know, you hear about a project like this and there's, there's always something that kind of goes, oh my gosh, that's, that makes me think of this or that resonates with with me in that way where will we start kim yeah hopefully my sound sorted is it yes yeah good kia, kia ora will it's fantastic thank you very much for that i really enjoyed uh listening to it from a whole lot of reasons really not just the science but also i guess the work that you're doing kind of connects emotionally a little bit um so that's uh yeah that's interesting like um for me um I had a question around the kind of uh, other auxiliary measurements that you're taking in order to relate the sightings and the, um, the work that you're doing with the climate change. Um, so what other data do you need for that and how are you collecting that and um, yeah, just expand on that a little bit would be good. Sure, thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, so NIWA, you probably know, <laughs> NIWA have a, an amazing oceanographic model, which seems to has a huge number of outputs. It's incredible. Um, I think probably what we're most interested for sperm whales is water column structure stuff. So, um, and things that might relate to obviously their prey. The sperm whales themselves aren't particularly bothered about the water temperature, I don't think. Um, they're big enough to cope with, you know, huge, huge changes. And so it's things that are going to affect their prey. And um, squid in particular seem to be really temperature sensitive and the spawning of quid, squid seems to be affected a lot by temperature. Um, we don't know where exactly the, those important changes, um, you know, the important parts are. Um, we need to do a bit more uh, research on squid biology um, and, and to try and find out. Um, but there are so many products in those NEWA models about water column structure and bottom temperature and um, temperature change over the you know first hundred meters. Um, it'll be a combination of those things and things that maybe uh, that concentrate prey. So you know again water column structure, um, thermocline depth, and so on. So those are the kind of things we're talking about. I'm I'm waving my arms a little bit because we don't know exactly. I'm I'm, I'm not an expert on squid biology um, yet, and I won't be. Stella will be the expert on squid biology, and she'll hopefully find out those things. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll be lots of products that are derived from ocean models. Marta might want to fill me in if, I'm, if I've said anything silly, because I probably did. <laughs> a thumbs up, that's a good sign, Will. That's a good sign. <laughs> Any other and, and so, sorry, sorry to yeah. cut you off, Rose. Um, you asked how they're going to be gathered. Um, some stuff will come from remote sensing, so we'll need remote sensing data to look back in time, for example. Um, some stuff will be contemporary, because um, I think the, the really derived products from, from the ocean model that Tom gave us are static in time. So, you know, we'll be, you know, bathymetry and stuff doesn't change, but um, there are quite big seasonal components to sperm whale distribution, for example. Um, and obviously the temporal changes through time relating to climate change are what we're interested in. So we'll have to use products that we can, that can look back in time as well. So that'll mostly come from remotely sensed data. Sean. Uh, hello, um, from Australia, University of Adelaide. I've really enjoyed being on this journey with you folk, putting together the proposal and seeing it come together. Congratulations. Uh, I just have a personal question um, to do with acoustics. 
uh, we're pioneering acoustic technology here to play underwater music to restore oyster reefs. Uh, and we've boosted oyster reef restoration from 10, 20 years down to three years as a consequence, uh, using highways of sound to navigate for these oysters, which are functionally extinct. I was just wondering with your application of acoustics, whether or not you can help me understand how that could be used to uh, attract um, cetaceans or whales, um, or whether it can repel them. We work with anthropogenic noise as well. What, what do you would think the scope is in that area? Yeah, cool. Sean, thank you. Nice to meet you. Um, I love the I love the sound of playing music to oysters. That's so cool. Um, we haven't tried playing music to sperm whales. Um, the, they're very sensitive to sound. Of course, they live in an, a completely acoustic world. Um, so, you know, they forage at a thousand meters where, where there's no light. So they're relying on sound completely. Um, we know that they're sensitive to anthropogenic, um, anthropogenic sounds. Um, there haven't been any studies in New Zealand, I don't think, but studies from other parts of the world, um, especially um, relating to sizing ex seismic um, uh, exploration and so on. So we know that sounds are a really important part for them. Um, there's, there are some potential impacts from sound in New Zealand. Um, we're not looking at that specifically with our project, but it is probably something we should consider when we're thinking about a changing environment. You know, it's not just climate, but we should be thinking about the soundscape as well. I think that's actually a really important thing to consider. And there will be highways and, you know, sound hotspots around New Zealand where we need to consider the impacts on sperm whales. Concerning playback experiments, that's been a little bit con controversial with cetaceans in the past, because of course, um, and people have tried it, um, but you know, you're playing back sounds made by some other individual and they can probably recognize an individual or what it sounds like. And so you've got to be very, very careful about the sounds that you play back. I've not heard of any studies that um, have used sounds successfully to attract things only that have used sounds to repel things with nasty noises, you know, acoustic deterrents that they use around aquaculture facilities, for example. Um, uh, it is, it, it could potentially be used to lure um, animals back to, to, to certain habitats, but I don't think it's been attempted yet. It's, uh, I think there are too many unknowns for us to predict what's going to happen. I think if you, maybe if you started playing, you know, the sounds of a male sperm whale back to a male sperm whale at Kaikoura, you might get your boat rammed or something like that. Um, it's, you know, the, the, who knows what's going to happen. But sound certainly a very important part of the project. We use it for finding the whales, we use it for studying them. And yeah, I think it's a really good point that we should be aware of, um, of the changing soundscape as well. Thank you very much. Wow, I was just watching Mina's face and my face as you guys were talking. It's from the well-being hull. Um, what? Um, this is amazing. <laughs> it's really uh, food for thought um, in terms of the work that that your teams are doing. Uh, very, very different space, uh, but fascinating. Brendan, I'm always wondering what you're thinking. Do you do you want to share <laughs> share with the class what you're thinking? Oh, I better think of something then, uh, right? <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing to say. Hey, um, yeah, no, yeah, thanks, Will. It was awesome. And, and to the team, I just, firstly, I just sort of really want to acknowledge, um, you know, the, the way that you have engaged with Kati Huirapa. And I know that the whanau are, um, you know, excited about the opportunities to, to be involved. So, uh, big mihi to, to you guys there. Everyone's uh, everyone that's not being able to get out there is quite jealous. <laughs> and um, but I think I think um, yeah, I, I think that uh, the the way that you're approaching that, you know, with having someone like Grant, who's you know like in that space and and his and his work that um, you you were talking about. Um, uh, consultation and I think you know it'll just be an, as you said I think something about organically growing and I think it's just naturally as the word gets out there'll be um, you know we're notoriously difficult to engage with you know the different runaka the you know you want to see the amount of emails that, that come through and so forth but yeah but I guess um, I was just thinking about um, you know we, just speaking about the sperm whales and um, you know the the migratory patterns of those but you know the other the other species of whales as well that Polynesians used for you know whether it was the sound of their uh, I, I don't know what you call the, the the breathing you know the blowhole and that kind of stuff and in terms of 
the migrations, you know, throughout Polynesia and the names and so forth. But are you, are you going to be looking at, um, I, I mean, you'll obviously come across other species, but um, yeah, the, uh, do, do you have plans regarding those other? We don't uh, have plans to study them, Brendan. Um, we see cool stuff out there, obviously. Um, uh, you know, on this on this last on the last trips off Otago, we were seeing pilot whales and beaked whales. Um, um, you know, Grant was really stoked about that. It was really nice on those. At, at Kaikoura, we see heaps of other stuff. Um, those surveys off Northland, we see all kinds of interesting creatures. So um, certainly, we acknowledge that, and we'll share all that stuff. Um, we don't have plans to study them as such, um, but I think that's a really important part of um, the community engagement stuff. Um, I think if we just talk about sperm whales the whole time, um, you know, maybe people will, will maybe you know, it won't be as exciting. Um, and so I think that's a really good way of engaging the community is to talk about the diversity of, of marine mammals out there. And, and like you say, the different stories um, and the different migration pathways and the, the connectedness of those different species, like the humpback whale, which is, you know, pikea, which is really um, significant as well. So, yeah, I think it's a really good thing to keep in mind, actually, and make sure we don't have the blinkers on too much. Um, um, well, when we were out on the Polaris um, last time, I think on the time series, we saw a couple of sperm whales re really close together within minutes of each other. So um, presumably they're both, you know, clicking away there. Is that easy to separate out the two individuals when they're close in time like that? Um, no, I mean, depends what you want to use the stuff for. If you, We can't separate, if they're very close together, we can't separate their clicks from each other. So we can't record them and say this comes from this one and this comes from the other one because it's just hard to tell who's who. Um, we can still use the data that we get at the surface and, you know, uh, we can, we know who the skin's coming from and we can record the surface behavior and so on. So that's all fine. Um, but yeah, the only challenge it comes to, to separating them acoustically because sound travels so fast underwater. Um, it travels such a long way that we could, you know, hear both sets of clicks simultaneously, essentially, until we couldn't tell which one was which. The, and the, so, so when there is two like that, will they be communicating with each other? So is it likely that there really, there's, there'd be a conversation going on and really those clicks would be totally kind of, I'm doing you know, this with my hands, but yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, as people talk, is that what we, happens? We don't, we don't know. So there's, I mean, there's no doubt they can hear each other. Um, and so they'll hear what, they'll hear what the other one's doing and they'll be, be able to hear the echoes from the other one's clicks as well. So they might be, they might be thinking, oh, that one over there is onto a good patch of squid or something. And so, you know, they might be eavesdropping and finding out what's going on. Um, that's a form of communication. You typically, in, in these situations out here where the, the, the big males, um, they're just foraging, they're just eating, they're not really interested, in, don't seem to be interested in hanging out with each other. They, they're probably there just because that's where the food is, you know, they're, they're, they're not really socializing. But having said that, we do see occasionally some social interactions. Um, you know, it's sperm whales will log up next to each other at the surface or whatever. At Kaikoura, for example, we've seen that quite a few times. So there's definitely some communication going on there. Um, we haven't figured out what they're saying, of course. Um, it's way too complex at the moment. Um, but yeah, and, and they, are, they are intimately aware of the other ones around them, for sure. And they can probably learn things from, you know, listening to each other's clicks. Like I said, we can study the structure of the clicks to figure out how big they are. They'll be able to tell that for sure, of course. And it might be that, that they can do it much better to the point of individual identity as well. And they know who's who just listen, from listening to their clicks. It's a, the acoustic side of things is just so fascinating. It is amazing. And the more you think about it, um, the more questions there are um, to, to address. And it's, a, it's one thing that, you know, it's kind of a whole nother layer to the to the to the project and the work that we do and it make one of the things that makes it so cool and interesting uh mina and i were having a conversation offline about whether the whales were saying rude things to each other uh, been <laughs> probably <recording. laughs> there's probably quite a bit of stuff off you know this is my yeah. patch da, 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 da. we had an idea a while ago that that you know they could kind of structure their feeding aggregations around you know biggest is best and is it that the biggest ones get to get to um, hang out in the in the best places to find food because they'd be able to tell it's a really honest signal about how big and brucey you are um, by listening to the other one's clicks um, and so there's, you know there's no way to fake it essentially your click is going to reflect how big you are 
Um, so we, we thought about that for a while and we thought about, about looking at um, different uh, distributions based on, on on the size of animals based on measuring their clicks and so, stuff. So yeah, I'm sure they are saying some interesting things to each other. Probably some really nice things as well. Like, oh, I haven't seen you for ages. Where have you been? Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Uh, uh, food for thought. Food for thought. Um, Hinarangi. I just thought um, if you can ask the question, Rose, then I'm going to ask this question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever considered swimming with the whales? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's the, it would be the coolest thing ever to do. Um, the regulations mean that we can't do it in New Zealand. It's not allowed. The Marine Mammal uh, Protection Regulations say that we can't do it. Um, but yes, you think about it every day. It would be super intimidating. Um, I know people who've been in the water with sperm whales and um, when they turn around to look at you and they start clicking on you and you can feel that reverberation in your chest that you are the intense focus of this um, 15 meter long 60 ton animal with an enormous mouth um, that could swat you just like that if it wanted to and it's intense focus you know intense intensely focused on just you uh, and you can feel it literally through your whole body then uh, then you can imagine that's quite intimidating but it would be about the most exciting thing in the world as well gosh but I, I, I'll, I'll tell you in secret sometime Hinalangi. <laughs> when something when it's not being recorded <laughs> oh that's amazing uh, not allowed that's, to in New Zealand. that's a very powerful image i think for us to finish on um amazing amazing creatures and putting us well and truly into scale and into our place uh in the in the world um thank you so much will uh and your team it's uh, it's always so much fun to come along to the Pukorero and and get inspired, uh, even though I work in a completely different realm um, to listen to uh, the process of research, the, the, the ups and downs, the, the organic nature of, of the way things unroll, but to still manage to do uh, fantastic work and create uh, a really interesting research platform. Uh, it's just, it's really, really inspiring. So thank you to you and the team and I, I know you presented to the board this morning so you've had a big day of of telling the story um so I hope you have an amazing uh, weekend uh, to have a bit of of rest as well and that goes for everyone um it's been a it's been a week uh for those of us down here at Otago it's mainly been water everywhere all the time uh so hopefully a little bit of sunshine for us would be lovely as well. I don't know what's happening in Australia. Um, <laughs> I don't imagine it's quite the same as situation as us, but I um, hope you are doing well over there as well too, Sean. Um, what I'll do is I'll put up our closing karakia and just like at the start, we can have a bit of a practice of, of, um, of learning in that space. Uh, she says, forgetting how to share her screen yet again. This must be this must be a sign that it's my last meeting of the day. I think I'm going to take it as that. Uh, okay. Kia to kia tato katoa te ata fai o to tato ariki a ihu karaiti me te aroha o te atua me te fa me te fifi na tahi tanga kite wai rua tapu aki 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 amine. Kia ora everyone. Uh, have an amazing weekend and hope to catch up with you all soon. <laughs> Kakite.